everybody. My name is Kat Kubitz, and I'm here with Katie Smallwood and Chilla Umajokin. And we're here from Seifarth Shaw, and we're going to be talking with you about hot topics on labor and employment law. But before we get into that, we want to tell you a little bit more about the Pro Bono Partnership of Atlanta. So their mission is to maximize the impact of pro bono engagement by connecting a network of attorneys with nonprofits in need of free business legal services. And in order to be a client of the Pro Bono Partnership of Atlanta, an organization must be a 501c3 nonprofit, be located in or serve the greater Atlanta area, serve low-income or disadvantaged individuals, and be unable to afford legal services. And if you'd like to get more information on the Pro Bono Partnership of Atlanta, you should visit their website, which is www.pbpatl.org. And they also host free monthly webinars on legal, legal topics for nonprofits. And if you want to see the upcoming webinars or workshops, again, visit their webpage and click on the workshops page. Or you can also join their mailing list by emailing that email address that you see on the screen. So as a disclaimer, uh, this webinar presents general guidelines for Georgia nonprofit organizations, but it shouldn't be considered legal advice. You should always consult an attorney to address if, to address a particular situation that you that faces you and your organization. And also, this presentation is copyrighted, so don't use, copy, disseminate, distribute, or publish this presentation without written permission from the Pro, Pro Bono Partnership of Atlanta. So, as it pertains to the three of us, um, as I mentioned, my name is Kat Kubis, this is Katie Smallwood, and this is Shola Omajokin. And we are Labor and Employment Associates at Seifarth Shaw, which is a law firm. And Seifarth has 13 offices around the world and more than 850 attorneys. And our Labor and Employment Practice was recently named Labor and Employment Team of the Year at the 10th Annual Chambers USA Awards for Excellence. Okay, so I will get into my portion of the presentation. And I will be discussing the recent Supreme Court cases that have an impact for employers. So just as a brief overview, I'm going to be talking about the Young versus UPS decision. And that decision addresses pregnancy discrimination and the proper interpretation of the Pregnancy Discrimination Act. And I'll also be talking about the EEOC versus Abercrombie and Fitch decision. And that addresses religious discrimination and what employer obligations are if they suspect that they have no actual knowledge of, a, of an applicant or an employee's need for a religious accommodation. So, as a brief reminder for some of you, or maybe a brief tutorial for others, uh, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, basically it tells employers that they have to treat all employees, whether they're in a protected class or not, they need to treat everybody equally. Um, I know some of you might be smaller organizations. Um, Title VII applies to employers that have 15 or more employees. And just as a quick overview, um, it's unlawful for an employer to fail or refuse to hire, to discharge, or to discriminate against employees because of their race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. And as you can see, I bolded religion and sex because those are what we're going to be talking about here today. And then, Title VII was amended in 1978 by the Pregnancy Discrimination Act. And I won't get into the specific details of that, but basically it clarifies that when Title VII says because of sex, that includes pregnancy and those affected by pregnancy. Um, so you can't discriminate. So if you discriminate against a woman because of her pregnancy, it's, you're discriminating against, against her because of her sex, and that's unlawful. Um, I've bolded the second bullet point um, because that was the that was the clause that the Supreme Court focused on the most in the Young decision that we're going to be digging into, um, and basically that says that employers must treat women affected by pregnancy the same for all employment-related purposes as other persons not so affected but similar in their ability or inability to work. I know it's a little bit a little little bit of legalese, but um, we'll dig into it a little bit more. So. As background for Young versus UPS, uh, the, the facts that, that led to the case were Peggy Young was a part-time delivery driver for UPS. And after she became pregnant, her doctor told her that she had a lifting restriction and she wasn't to lift anything more than 20 pounds. Well, that was a problem for UPS because one of the essential functions of her job as a delivery driver was to be able to lift up to 70 pounds. And so UPS told her that she was unable to work with, with that lifting restriction. 
Um, where it started to get a little bit tricky, though, was UPS had a policy that it provided light duty for employees who were injured on the job, so who would otherwise, if they weren't given light duty, they would otherwise be out on workers' compensation. They also gave it to employees who had disabilities covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act. And then the third category of people was for employees who had lost their Department of Transportation certifications. Again, just talking about delivery drivers here. So um, the policy on its face is, is neutral. It doesn't overtly discriminate against any particular group. Um, but Ms. Young said that that policy should apply to her um, and that she should be entitled to the same light duty accommodations as the other employees. Um, UPS disagreed, and so she went out on unpaid leave for the duration of her pregnancy while she had that lifting restriction. And then when she had her baby, she came back to work. Well, she filed suit, and the district court ruled in favor of UPS. And the reason why they did that was they found that Ms. Young wasn't similarly situated to the people that had been given light duty. And so we'll get into that, but they found in favor of UPS. And then she appealed that decision, and it went to the Fourth Circuit, but the Fourth Circuit agreed and said that UPS hadn't violated the Pregnancy Discrimination Act. So after that, the Supreme Court decided to hear the case. And so basically, the Supreme Court agreed to hear the case because they wanted to clarify how the Pregnancy Discrimination Act should be interpreted. And the issue was really whether the Pregnancy Discrimination Act applies to situations when the employer has a facially neutral policy, but that it ultimately accommodates more employees with, that, with a non-pregnancy related disability um, and doesn't accommodate, preg doesn't accommodate employees with a pregnancy related uh, disability. So I will warn you though that while this is a Supreme Court decision, it's fairly convoluted, um, and which is why I've, I've outlined the issue in the holding, and in the holding I say probably yes. Um, what the court does do, though, is they provide a legal framework for how a plaintiff like Miss Young, um, somebody with a pregnancy, with a normal pregnancy, but, you know, that has some type of limitation because of that pregnancy, how the their burdens of proof if they want to bring a claim against their employer. So. I'll kind of try to break it down for you guys, um, and so that it won't be won't be too legally. But um, basically, how it works is, if a plaintiff wants to bring a case against her employer um, based on the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, she needs to prove four things. The first is that she's in a protected class, so that she's pregnant. The second is that she needs an, that she sought an accommodation, as in this case, a light duty position while she was pregnant. And the third is that the employer didn't accommodate her, like here UPS um, instead put her on unpaid leave. And then the fourth and most difficult prong is she needs to prove that the employer did accommodate others similar in their ability or inability to work. And why I put that in quotes is because that fourth prong was actually not decided by the Supreme Court, um, and that raised genuine issues of fact. Um, but I wanted you to know what she needed to prove. Um, and then if, if, in this hypothetical, if a plaintiff does prove all four of those elements, then the burden shifts back, the burden shifts back to the employer to say, well, this is the reason why, and to give a legitimate non-discriminatory reason for the decision to not accommodate. And then if they can meet that burden, it shifts back to the plaintiff to show that the employer's reason was really bogus and to show that it's untruthful and what we call pretextual. Um, and the court clarified that in this situation, for an employee to prove pretext, uh, they need to show that the, the employer's reasoning imposes a significant burden on pregnant workers, and that the employer's non-discriminatory reasons are not sufficiently strong to justify that burden. So those are kind of, that's kind of the lay of the land. Um, but because there was that question on that fourth prong, the Supreme Court sent the case back to the Fourth Circuit to make a decision based on their guidance. And for those of you that are dying to know what the Fourth Circuit said, I have bad news. Um, UPS and Ms. Young uh, actually settled their case last month. So they won't be making it, they won't be issuing a decision. Um, but I will tell you, and why I bring it up now, is it's important to note that one of the reasons why they chose to settle the case was because UPS had decided 
without admitting any type of fault, they decided to um, change their policies and to permit light duty for pregnant women in addition to those other categories of people. So I just wanted you guys to know that some larger employers are making decisions to proactively change their policies, and we'll get into that. Um, in the background of all of this happening, um, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, Commission issued new guidance in July of last year in response to litigation, actually in response to the decision of the Supreme Court to hear the young case. And so basically what they were doing in doing that was they were saying, hey guys, this is what we think about it. Um, and the guidance they issued was unsupported by case law. Um, and it was a pretty bold change because it was the first change since 1983 to that guidance. And they said, based on their interpretation, granted it doesn't carry the weight of law, but they said that all pregnant workers, even if it is a normal pregnancy, should be accommodated as other employees who might be considered disabled under the, American, the Americans with Disabilities Act should be accommodated. So to go through the interactive process and things like that. Well, that was a pretty bold shift, um, and it actually got uh, struck down to a certain extent in the Young decision. Um, it raised eyebrows based on the timing and based on the significant change. And in the in the Supreme Court opinion, the Supreme Court said we're not following the EEOC's guidance, and so they changed it in response. Um, but the reason why I bring it up is because the EEOC has identified pregnancy discrimination as a strategic enforcement priority. And so, as you can see, based on the numbers I've included, uh, the EOC has filed several pregnancy-related lawsuits, um, and it's definitely a hot button, hot topic uh, for employees to be aware of and to um, consider. And so, in light of that, um, there's certain, there are certain impacts that, on empl that, employers, should, that employers should know about. Um, for instance, this is a good time to remind you that the Americans with Disability Act was amended and now the definition of disability has been broadened. And so more pregnancy-related impairments, for instance, things like uh, gestational diabetes, things like that, are likely fall within um, the definition of, dis of uh, disability and likely need to be um, accommodated if it's not an undue burden on the employer. Additionally, employers should review and update their policies um, and strongly consider, you know, again, being proactive instead of reactionary and consider, um, a, you know, having some type of light duty for pregnant workers, um, even though it is a little bit, you know, even though they might not definitely have to, it can definitely, you would be able to avoid liability in doing so. And um, employers should also be aware of state and municipality pregnancy accommodation laws. Um, so in some states, you have greater requirements to accommodate pregnant workers, um, a higher threshold than uh, the federal law. And additionally, it'd be good for employers to train managers and employees on these laws and policies and advise them to, to direct concerns to human resources or, if it's extreme, consider consulting um, legal counsel. So shifting gears, now that we're done with the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, we're shifting to e the EEOC versus Abercrombie. And luckily, this is a bit more straightforward. Um, but in that case, there was a teenager, Samantha Eloff, and she applied for a Salesforce position at an Abercrombie and Fitch store. Um, she's a practicing Muslim, and she wore a headscarf to the interview. But during the interview, her and the interviewer didn't discuss religion or any type of need for accommodation. Um, and she did very well. In fact, um, the interviewer scored her based on the objective uh, criteria that Abercrombie has, and they found her qualified for hire. But she, the assistant manager that interviewed her was concerned because there was a look policy that um, gave guidelines to employees on what would be appropriate and non-appropriate to wear to work. And in that policy, it prohibited caps. Granted, CAPS wasn't defined in the policy, and so the assistant manager reached out to the, the, ma the store manager and then the district manager, and the district manager informed her not to hire uh, Ms. Eloff because it violated the look policy. Um, so then uh, Ms. Eloff 
Well, then the EEOC filed suit on behalf of Ms. Eloff, and the district court ruled in favor of the EEOC and found that there was a violation um, because they didn't accommodate her religious her religious beliefs. And um, then the Tenth Circuit, and then they appealed it, and the Tenth Circuit ruled um, also in favor of Abercrombie. Um, uh, sorry, <laughs> the Tenth Circuit then ruled and switched the decision and ruled in favor of Abercrombie and said that employer cannot be liable without actual knowledge for the need for an accommodation. So then it comes up to the Supreme Court. And so as a reminder, Title VII prohibits an employer from refusing to hire an applicant in order to avoid accommodating a religious practice that it could accommodate without an undue hardship. Um, so within that framework, the question before the court was whether um, they only, that prohibition only applied where the applicant informed the employer of her need for an accommodation um, or, you know, as, as in this case, since it was silent, what the employer's obligations were. Well, the court ruled nearly unanimously, actually, that the employer does not need to have actual knowledge um, of a religious accommodation need. Um, instead, the applicant only needs to show that her need for the accommodation was a motivating factor in the decision not to hire. And the reason for that, the Supreme Court turned to um, the language of Title VII, and, and there's more indi indications that a motivating factor um, is, is the standard. So there's no knowledge requirement, um, and that's important for employers to remember. So employers can't just dig their head in the sand and say, I didn't know. Um, so the bottom line is an employer may not make an applicant's religious practice, whether it's confirmed or not, a factor in their employment decisions. So in terms of the impact on employers, um, first and foremost, it's important to update training for hiring managers and interviewers. Um, and that needs to be that needs to be fairly elaborate in the fact that it should have things like questions questions that they should ask, questions that they shouldn't ask, um, how to handle religious accommodation requests, when to involve HR, things like that. Um, they also, it's also a good reminder to not ask about religion or make assumptions based on stereotypes about religion. Um, and then it's also important to make the work rules clear to the applicants. So if an applicant walks in with religious clothing or a headscarf rather than assuming that they might need a some type of accommodation, just set forth the rules and say, would this pose a problem for you? And if they say yes, again, don't assume it's because of their religion, but ask them why. Um, and then if they explain why and it's a religious-based reason, then consider engaging in the interactive process with them. And so talk about ways that it could be accommodated without being a burden on the employer. And it's important to set the right tone um, that the employer should you know, always be respectful regardless of their own opinion on the religion. And um, if things start to get particularly tricky, um, it's important to remember that you should always consult counsel. So with that, I will trade the mic with Katie Smallwood. Good morning, everyone. So we're going to turn now to talking about Gina. And Gina is not a person. Gina is actually the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. And this is a law that was passed back in 2008. So it's actually a fairly recent development in terms of labor and employment laws in this country. Um, but recently, in the past year, there's been a lot of activity under the law that can impact how employers deal with health-related issues for their employees. And similar to Title VII, GINA applies to employers that have 15 or more employees. Um, there's some more that goes into figuring out if you are an employer under the way the Act defines that. But essentially, if you have 15 or more employees, it likely applies to you as an employer. So first, let's talk about what GINA is. Um, GINA makes it illegal for an employer to discriminate against an employee on the basis of that employee's genetic information. And the law defines genetic information um, in a few different ways. Um, genetic information can be information about an employee's uh, genetic test. It can be information about the employee's uh, family member's genetic test. 
And it can also be information um, about the manifestation of a disease or disorder in the family members of the employee. So all three of those things fall under the definition of genetic information. And there's a few exceptions to the overarching rule. Um, so I'll, I'll go back for a minute and say, you know, I mentioned that the employer cannot discriminate against the employee on the basis of genetic information. They also are not allowed to request or require or purchase their employee's genetic information. So that's the overarching rule. There are six different exceptions under the law to that overarching rule. Um, I won't go into each of the exceptions because they're not all important to the discussion today, but the main one that we'll get into a little bit later is the fact that uh, employers can get some genetic information uh, during wellness tests and activities that they have at the place of business. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, but for now, we'll, we'll start talking about one of the big recent developments under the law. Um, in 2015, there was a case here in Georgia, and it was in federal court here in the Northern District, so right in our very own Atlanta. And the case involved a company called Atlas Logistics Group. And the company was involved in, one of the things they're involved in was shipping uh, food and produce that would go to grocery stores. And they had warehouses that the food would come in and out of. And unfortunately for the company, somebody in one of the warehouses started leaving piles of feces, um, not a pleasant idea, but there's really no other way to say it, around the warehouses of the company. And they couldn't figure out who was doing this. It kept happening. The employer investigated to try and figure it out. And they narrowed it down to two employees that they were suspicious of based on the times that the employees were in certain areas of the warehouses. Um, but they weren't sure whether those employees were the um, people leaving the unpleasant packages around the warehouse. So what the employer decided to do was to collect samples and take a cheek swab from the two employees that they suspected and run tests to determine whether the genetic makeup of these two employees matched the feces that was left around the warehouse. Well, it turned out that both of the employees were innocent. They were not the uh, culprit in this situation. But they were upset because they said they became the target of nasty jokes around the workplace. Word got out that they were suspected of this disgusting activity. Um, and so they sued their employer under GINA. Um, and this was sort of a surprising theory to use for the law because, you know, the employer wasn't collecting genetic information in order to find out that these employees had some sort of disease and then discriminate against them on the basis of that disease. The employer was simply wanting to find out who was going around the warehouse leaving excrement so that they could stop it from happening, which is obviously a, a legitimate business concern for a company who's shipping food products. So the case went to the Northern District of Georgia, and um, the parties tried to get the case resolved earlier by filing what's known as motions for summary judgment, where before the case goes to trial, the judge can make a decision and say, I don't think you have enough of an argument to go all the way to a trial, and we're going to cut it off here. Uh, but the judge ruled against uh, the employer at that stage of the litigation and found that the plaintiffs had a viable theory to move forward on. So the case went to trial, and in June of 2015, the jury found in favor of the employees and they awarded them over $2 million in damages. Uh, so this was quite a surprising result, um, and it's changed the way a lot of employers around the country are thinking about this law. Um, it's a good reminder that under the law, the way it's written, you really have to be very cautious about any kind of collection of genetic information, even if it doesn't seem on its surface that it's being collected for a discriminatory purpose. Um, the bottom line is that as an employer, you're not supposed to have it. You're not supposed to require the employee to give it to you. And if you break that rule, 
subject to one of the six exceptions, you could be in a lot of trouble financially. Um, so that was the case of the devious defecator, as it was nicknamed by the judge, and that was you know, resolved just recently this summer. So it's still a developing area of law, but it's something to keep in mind if you have any kind of situation where you might be tempted to ask your employees for their genetic information. So the other recent development in the area of GINA, and this is very recent, is that on October 30th of this year, so just last month, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission released a new proposed rule that would uh, concern how GINA applies to wellness programs that are offered by employers. Um, and these are the type of programs you may be familiar with that a lot of employers offer where employees can go to a conference room at the office place, they can have wellness screenings, they might get blood drawn. Um, a lot of times, depending on the type of health plan that the employer offers, an employee's spouse or family members may be able to come in and take part in the wellness program as well. Um, and this brings up one of those six exceptions that we talked about to the rules. So under the way the law is drafted, um, if the employer offers health or wellness services as part of a wellness program and the employee provides written and voluntary consent to have their genetic information collected, um, the employer can go ahead and collect that genetic information. However, only the licensed healthcare professional and the employee themselves are allowed to see the information and have knowledge of the information. It can't go directly to the employer. Um, it can be disclosed to the employer in aggregate terms, but not in terms of a specific employee. So that's essentially how the exception works when it comes to wellness programs. So the way the regulations are set up right now around that exception, um, employees cannot be required to provide genetic information um, as a result of receiving incentives or penalties from the employer. So what that means in non-legalese is that you as an employer cannot say to your employee, if you come to this wellness program and allow us to swab your cheek or draw your blood and access your genetic information, we will give you some sort of discount on your health premiums. Or if you don't come do this, we will penalize you by charging you a higher cost. You can't do that as an employer for your own employees. But it wasn't clear how that would apply to employees' spouses or children who might also be covered under the employer's health plan. Um, and so the new rule that's been proposed by the EEOC is aimed at addressing that specific question. Um, and what the rule says is that employers can offer limited inducements or penalties based on whether the employee's spouse would provide genetic information. Um, it has to be capped at a certain percentage of the value of the health plan, and that's 30%. Um, so that number will obviously differ based on the type of health plan you have and the specific numbers involved. Um, it is still the case that you cannot penalize or offer an inducement to collect genetic information from an employee's children. So that, that is still in line with the rules for the employees themselves. The only exception this rule proposes is with regard to spouses. Um, the rule has not gone into effect, and employers have until late December to comment on the proposed language. I've put a link in the presentation where you can go leave a comment if you are so inclined to do that. Um, and until it goes into effect or is approved, it doesn't actually govern anything. So it's not the law right now. It's just a proposal for how to amend the law and make the regulations more clear. But assuming it goes into place as it's currently drafted, it's something that employers are going to have to start complying with in the very near future. Um, I've also included a link in the materials to the text of the proposed rule. So if you want to familiarize yourself with the details, you can go to the website and look at that there um, and kind of get ramped up for um, bringing yourself in line with the new rule. So a couple
couple of points on Gina in terms of practical advice. The first one I just mentioned is with this new rule regarding wellness programs, you'll want to familiarize yourself with that. Make sure that once it goes into effect, you're complying with it and that you understand your obligations and restrictions in terms of those wellness programs, both with respect to your employees, but also their family members. Um, you also, in light of the recent jury award here in Georgia and the fact that GINA cases have been popping up with more frequency around the country, you want to make sure that you have policies in place that make sure that your supervisors and managers are complying with the law and not collecting or requiring genetic information where they shouldn't be. And then you'll want to do training on those policies and make sure that your managers and supervisors really understand the limits that they're operating in so that they don't make a mistake similar to the one that was made in the Atlas case where they thought they were collecting information for a very innocent purpose and it turned out to be very costly for the company. So that brings us to the end of our discussion about Gina. And I want to turn now to another hot topic that has been uh, resulting in a lot of recent developments just this past year, and that's the issue of independent contractors. So a lot of you watching this may have employees who are full-time, part-time, whatever, but you may also have independent contractors who are people that are not your employees. Um, a traditional example of an independent contractor might be somebody that you bring in temporarily to, say, design a website for you. You're not hiring them as an employee, you just need a limited set of services from them. So you sign a contract or an agreement, and they provide the services, you pay them, and then they go on their way and provide services to many other organizations as well. So that's what you might traditionally think of as an independent contractor. And the difference is very important because you have to follow a lot of rules in terms of payment and treatment for your employees that you don't have to follow for an independent contractor. Um, so on July 15th of this past summer, the Department of Labor's Wage and Hour Division issued new guidance on how to determine whether an individual is really an independent contractor or an employee of your organization. Um, and the guidance essentially widened the ways in which a person can be deemed an employee. So it makes it much easier for someone who you think is an independent contractor to actually be held an employee of your organization. Um, now, to be clear, this guidance has not been accepted by the courts yet. It's not an official rule or law. Um, it's just a statement from the relevant agency that enforces these laws saying, hey, this is our opinion on how this should work. And so it does have some weight for some courts considering the issue, and it's important to know about because it's telling you, it's telegraphing to employers what the agency thinks and how they are going to react if they're pursuing somebody for violating the law. Um, and once again, I've posted a link to the text of the guidance and the materials so that you can access it and read it for yourself if you think this is an issue that may be important to you. So the way the law stands right now is there's a six-factor test. It's commonly referred to as the economic realities test for determining whether an individual is an independent contractor or an employee of the organization. And the factors are um, the extent to which the work is integral to the business. So, for example, if you are an organization that provides uh, teaching services and you have somebody come in and they're teaching, that's pretty integral. It's going to be difficult to say that they're an independent contractor. Um, the next factor is whether the worker's managerial skills affect their opportunity for profit or loss. So are you just paying this person a set wage or can they earn more by being more efficient, for example? Um, the other factors include how much the worker invests in uh, equipment that they use, their skill and initiative, uh, the permanency of the relationship. So is this a relationship going on for years or is this something that's a few weeks and then it's over? And then the last uh, 
factor to consider is the nature and degree of control that the employer exercises, and that's often been one of the most, if not the most important factor. So the new guidance that was issued on July 15th um, keeps these six factors. It's not attempting to change the relevant factors. But what it's doing is saying, here's how we view which factors are important, which factors might be less important, and how to interpret the factors. And I've listed here the factors that they're emphasizing and the ones that they're de-emphasizing. And one of the ones they're de-emphasizing is whether the business has control over the service provider, which is interesting because, as I mentioned, that's often been a very important factor. Um, what They're also emphasizing things like uh, you know, whether the services are integrated into the business, whether the service provider has an opportunity for financial loss, um, the degree of financial investment by the service provider, which the agency is indicating should be quite large, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. So all of this is essentially saying that most people are going to fall into the employee bucket rather than the independent contractor bucket. And one of the quotes from the interpretive guidance that the agency has issued is actually that most workers are employees under the law. Um, and I've included some categories of service providers that have been targeted here. And it's something, this is not an exhaustive list, but it's just examples to get you thinking about the types of service providers that your organization uses. Um, because you might be surprised by the types of services that could get you into trouble with this independent contractor issue. You know, if you have, for example, a janitorial service coming in and cleaning your building at night, you might think, hey, they're employed by the janitorial company. That's got nothing to do with me. They're definitely not my employee. But it depends. It really depends on the situation and how the facts fit into the factors that we discussed earlier. Because if you're exercising sufficient control, if the relationship is long-term enough, if the services they're providing are closely related to what your business does, all of that could really shift that person into the employee bucket and out of the service provider bucket. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, so for the practical point of view here, the guidance that's been issued is not law yet. So it's not something that is hard and fast, this is the way it's going to be. But it is important because it's coming from the agency that's responsible for enforcing the law. It could certainly influence courts in future litigation. We don't know the extent to which it will influence influence courts. Um, it's something that you just need to be aware of and think about in terms of your contractual agreements with service providers for your organization to make sure that you're not stepping too close to the line and, you know, treating someone like an employee when you're not paying them like an employee. Um, because if you make a mistake, and turning to the next slide on this point, um, if you make a mistake and you have somebody classified as an independent contractor and it turns out that they are an employee, you could be subject to penalties under the Fair Labor Standards Act for misclassification. You could have to pay them back wages. There could be tax implications as well. So you can look at a big financial hit if you make a mistake in this area. So it's important to really audit your practices look at who you have coming in and out of the organization, and make sure you have all your ducks in a row. And that wraps up independent contractors, so I will hand the microphone down to Shola. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so Catherine had spoken about uh, the expansion of the definition of a employee on, under the independent contractor. Um, prism. We're also seeing a similar expansion in the definition of who is an employer um, in the context of a joint employment relationship. Uh, to backtrack a little bit, um, we have a statute called the National Labor Relations Act. Um, it's an older statute, so it was enacted in 1935. And that statute essentially governs 
everything leading up to the formation of a union at an employer site. So for example, if employees get together and decide that they want to have a union to represent them at that employer, um, campaigning activities, discussions regarding getting or forming a union um, will be covered by the National Labor Relations Act. Even after that, the act also governs contractual terms and con um, bargaining negotiations between the union on behalf of the employee and the employer. Um, so it's a pretty broad statute that is enforced by what we call the National Labor Relations Board. That's a five-person board um, made up of members who are typically appointed by the president. Right now, um, we have it's pretty, it, it can get pretty partisan. So right now we have about three members who some would consider to be Democratic leading, leaning and two members who some would consider to be Republican leaning or appointed by Republican um, president. So recently, in August, or actually prior to August, the test for whether an entity would be considered a joint employer under the National Rela Labor Relations Board and therefore subject to the requirements of that statute um, was whether that entity exercised sufficient indicia of control um, over the employees of a separate entity. To put that in context, um, think of a staffing agency. So you, you have an employer who contracts for janitorial workers from a staffing agency. Those people are not their employees. So for example, they're paid through the staffing agency. Um, their schedules are determined through the staffing agency, but they work on the premises of what we can, what we'll call the user entity. Um, previously, before before the user entity could be considered to be a joint employer, they would have had to exercise direct and immediate control um, over matters that meaningfully affect the employment relationship. Um, so over matters that would meaningfully affect hiring, um, firing, discipline, supervision, um, compensation, um, and work direction. To give an example, if as a user entity you have the authority to hire someone to come onto your premises and work as a janitorial worker, um, if you had input into that decision with the staffing agency, you could be considered a joint employer. But the test at the time, um, so prior to August, essentially required you to take an active role in overseeing the hiring and the general employment of the workers of your staffing agency. Starting in August, in August 2015, um, specifically on August 27th, the National Labor Relations Board essentially expanded this test. Um, so what the board said was that even if you exercise indirect control, um, or even if in a contract with the staffing agency, you reserve the right to exercise some form of control, that would be sufficient to become a joint employer. This decision is known as the Brown and Ferris um, decision. And the issue before the court there, which is similar to what we've been talking about, is that Brown and Ferris Industries was, is a waste management company. Um, they had engaged a staffing agency, Lidpoint, um, to essentially supply various categories of workers um, at their manufacturing or waste manufacturing and disposal plant out in California. The employees of Lidpoint decided that they wanted to form a union. Um, so the issue was whether A, they could, and B, whether Brown and Ferris had to engage in those discussions as a joint employer. Of course, Brown and Ferris's position was that they were not a joint employer. Their position, which a lot of agent companies take, was that these are the workers of our staffing agency. Um, we essentially deal with the staffing agency, but we don't deal with these employees. Um, we don't pay them. We don't discipline them. Um, we don't evaluate their performance. We don't deal with them as workers. So that was you know, that was Browning Ferris's position. Of course, the employees disagreed, and typically employees would, um, because think about just the structure of a staffing agency and a user entity. The user entity is typically a larger company um, that might, that's larger, that might have deeper pockets. 
So if you're an employee, you typically want to deal with both companies because from your perspective, um, you know, the user entity is the larger company. So the employees in that, in this particular case, argue that both Lee Point and Brown and Ferris were their employee, employers and should be at the negotiating table, essentially. In a three to two decision, um, the National Labor Board's majority found that Brown and Ferris was and is a joint employer with Lee Point. Um, in doing so, the court emphasized how the realities of the marketplace has changed, so essentially meaning we have so many types of alternative work arrangements now um, that essentially that holding that different entities were not employers um, would not actually reflect the practical realities of the marketplace. In doing so, the court vastly expanded the types and the numbers of entities that could potentially be responsible for unfair labor practices under the National Labor Relations Act, or could also you know, potentially be required to be at the negotiating table with the union and with the employees. So a lot of people often think you know, this decision doesn't relate to me because we don't have unionized employees. Um, but in reality, it does. Because if you have a relationship with a staffing agency, um, if they provide services to you, it could implicate, this decision could implicate your arrangement. Um, with, we're seeing a lot of activity with franchises and franchisors. So, you know, it could also, in, the franchisor, I think McDonald's, could also be held to be the joint employer of one of its franchises employees. So there are a number of ways in which this decision could impact even non-unionized employers. Um, so it's something to pay attention to. Another reason why it's important is that this could go beyond just the National Labor Relations Act. Um, we're seeing different agencies essentially try to adopt the reasoning of the Brown and Ferris Board and implement them in their statutes. So for example, we have the wage and hour dis um, decision related to what Catherine was talking about with the independent contractors. And you know they've also indicated that the Brown and Ferris decision could provide a template for how they define and interpret the economic realities test. Um, so it could lead to an expansion of entities that could be subject to the wage and, and hour statutes enforced by that division. We're also seeing it with um, the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. That stat that agency has um, jurisdiction and typically enforces a wide variety of anti-discrimination statutes, Title VII, um, the Age of Discrimination and Employment Act, the Americans with Disabilities Act. In this case, they actually filed uh, what's called a MECAS brief, uh, which is essentially a supporting brief that supported an expanded view, an expanded definition of an employer. Um, so to the extent that they actually also adopt that and actually start um, interpreting the jo a joint employer this broadly, it could affect quite a number of companies in the discrimination, retaliation, um, harassment context and with those types of lawsuits. Um, same thing with um, OSHA, that's the Occupational Safety Health Administration. Um, so to the extent, for example, a staffing agency's worker has suffered an injury, um, are you also liable as a joint employer? Those are the types of issues that could come into play um, with that agency and with those statutes. Um, same thing with the Employee Benefits Security Administration and the OFCCP. The OFCCP is interesting. That's essentially the agency that governs um, the implementation of federal contracts. So if you have a contract with the federal government, there are certain standards and certain requirements that you have to follow. That agency makes sure that you do so. So if you have, if a staffing agency you're engaged with has a federal contract, you might be on the hook as a joint employer to make sure that they are actually following the requirements. Um, so as you can see, this really has a broad, a potentially broad um, implication for various agencies and across various parts of the law. The next few charts are really just slides just showing um, how this could 
impact you even if you're not a unionized um, employer. Um, so for example, if you have service providers um, in the janitorial space, maintenance workers, um, certain accounting type services, if you, if you have arrangements um, that deal with that, you could be a joint employer. Um, take retailers, for example, and I will use Costco as an example. Um, if Costco suppliers, Costco's maintenance services, um, all of these different um, bars essentially show the categories of entities that could um, get liability for joint employer status. Also, you have, you know, if you're using independent contractors or, and that independent contractor has a worker, um, so it's a 10 person independent contractor entity, you know, that could be implicated here, even though you yourself are not unionized, or they might not be, but just thinking broadly, that could come into play. Um, if you're a parent company with a subsidiary and the subsidiary is unionized, um, you as a parent company could be liable as a joint employer. Um, if you're an investor um, and you have ownership in a unionized entity, um, that could also come into play. Um, so really, any entity that outsources um, or has an alternative working arrangement um, could be found to be a joint employer. And you know, in today's realm, you know, just having the right to control, um, just exercising any level of control, even indirect, um, could qualify and could be sufficient for a joint employer binding. And certain things really to consider there are, you know, look at all of your relationships, um, look at all of your contracts, see what type of language is in there. Um, if you do have, if you do have relationships with a staffing agency or alternative agencies, um, see if you're reserving the right to control certain aspects of employment for these workers. Um, for example, are you reserving the right to control who can be hired onto your premises? Are you reserving the right to control performance and compensation arrangements? Um, things of that nature, the NRB and other agencies are looking closely at. So it's something that you also would want to pay attention to in your contract. Now, like a lot of areas of the law, this is very fact specific. Um, so it's we try to provide advice and guidance, recognizing that your particular relationships are different. Um, so to the extent that you start performing a review of your policies and your practices and your arrangements and need additional help or need, um, you know, you need someone to interpret whether you are in compliance or could be found to be a joint employer, please contact an attorney or contact counsel to help you with that. Um, also, it's really important to train your managers. It's really important to train your supervisors. Typically, your managers are supervising the work of your traditional employees and also the work of the staffing agency's um, workers. Um, that is a delicate balance, um, and they need to understand what to do and what not to do so that you're not found to be a joint employer. Um, also, make sure that you're addressing any source of control um, just related to the to your contractual agreement, but any other indirect source of control that you might exert um, over these workers. So for example, are you exerting control over their schedules? Um, some of it is unavoidable. So if you run an eight to five operation and need workers there at eight to five, you you know it's that's what that's what the business needs are. But essentially examine all of these areas just to see if there's any um, vulnerability there and if there are any instances or examples where you could be found to be a joint employer. So the next area in which the National Labor Relations Board is very active um, is with social media. In today's world, workers are so connected. Um, the social media is essentially a part of life. You have Facebook, you have Instagram, you have Twitter, um, you have Pinterest, you have instant mess messaging services. Um, and people, most individuals are vocal, and they're vocal about every aspect of their life. 
it so happens that their employment and their work relationships are also a core aspect of their lives. So the government has been trying to figure out how to regulate that conduct. And you know, employers have to be increasingly sensitive um, about A, the different agencies at play um, and, and different statutes and rules at play, and B, um, their policies. So issues arise in this area when employers use social media to hire people. So for example, um, running background checks, going on Facebook, uh, which a lot of human resources departments do. So just look up an applicant and see what's going on and see what they're posting. Um, when employers conduct internal investigations, so for example, you have a complaint of harassment, um, so you consult social media to see what's going on. And when employees talk about work, um, so for example, when an employee complains about their manager um, on Facebook. With these, with, with all of these situations, we have to be concerned um, about A, making sure that we're not infringing on their rights to communicate um, and speak about their work. Um, that we're also protecting our trade secrets and our reputation, so making sure that em employees are not making statements that do not fully represent the company or statements that could look bad on the company. Section 7 of the National Labor Relations Act essentially protects every worker's right to engage in protected concerted activity. So this section is particularly important because it, it applies to all employers, both union employers and non-union employers. And the theory there is, you know, if they start, if employees want to start talking about their work conditions, that could be a precursor to a union formation. So at that point, as an employer, you shouldn't be able to stop or hinder that, and you should, it should essentially be a free expression. Um, what you generally want to be aware of is having really broad policies that forbid employees from talking about their wages, that forbid employees from talking about their working conditions. Um, you want to avoid vague policies that forbid inappropriate communications um, because it's, it can be unclear what that means. Um, and you want to forbid, you want to avoid policies that forbid them from making negative comments about the employer, because some of those comments, for example, could be legitimate. Um, you know, if if there's a complaint about a harassing supervisor, and that the complaint is actually true, you don't want to forbid them from making uh, comments about that on social media. Now, employees are protected in the when they do talk with each other physically. They're also protected when they make those comments on social media. So when they tweet, um, when they make Facebook comments, when you even like a Facebook comment, um, that's protected. So for example, if Catherine has a Facebook comment about our employer um, and talks about our wages and how she wants to see higher pay, and I like that comment, that's that could be protected activity. Now what employees cannot do is make unauthorized statements on behalf of the company if they don't have authority to do that. They cannot reveal our trade secrets or confidential company information. They cannot violate company policies and valid company policies. Um, and they cannot harm um, company systems or our reputation. And harm company systems would, for example, mean visiting a website um, that's forbidden by company policy that might have malicious um, kind of malware on there that then is loaded onto the computer. I just have a quick hypothetical here. Um, and it says, Sandra, so if Sandra, a service clerk of yours, tweets on her iPhone that her manager is so sick of Matt coming, making me come back from lunch early, really sucks, hashtag. What do you do in that position? Um, I mean, the first thing you want to do is find out who Matt is. To the extent that Matt is a manager, you know, that essentially brings into play various other situations. Um, it's a public tweet, so Sandra has no expectation of privacy, but at the same time, she does have the right to talk about having to come back in from lunch early. So what you typically or ideally want to do there is investigate what she's complaining about, investigate if there are meal break violations here and she is being made to come back from, um, from her lunch break early um, and, and, and go from there. You should not counsel her or subject her to, to a corrective action because she made that tweet public because that could implicate 
Section 7 of the, of the National Labor Relations Act. Um, so to conclude, just review your policies, make sure your policies and social media and employee communications are tight, make sure that they're not broad um, and they don't have vague language like inappropriate, um, as an example. Um, make sure you also modify broad language and policies that prohibit employees from discussing either on social media or physically things about their employment, so their wages, um, the policies, their dress and appearance codes, as an example. Um, eliminate or adjust language prohibiting posting of company logos, company names, identification of employee with the company. It's a delicate balance there, but you want to make sure that that language in your policy as well is tight to the extent that you have it. Um, do not have policies that require employees not to discuss their wages. Um, so, for example, don't have a policy that says you can't tell your coworker how much you earn. Um, make sure that in your policies you have a disclaimer in there stating that um, the provisions are not intended to violate the National Labor Relations Act. Now, that's not going to shield you from a claim to the extent that the policy itself is um, improper or does violate the act, but it's something, it's a buffer to have to the extent that you can. Um, you can still restrict the use of intellectual property because that's the company's property. Um, you can still bar the use of social media during working hours and also restrict what they can visit on a company computer. And you can still require that employees dis um, disclose any opinion on social media as their personal opinion and not representing the company. Thank you. So the question is, are there any consequences for workers in other countries? Now, that's an interesting question. Um, outside of the, there, most statutes apply to companies with workers in the United States. Um, but there are some statutes and there are some courts that are interpreting statutes a little broadly to essentially say, if you are a US, if you're a worker of a company in the US, and for example, you know, you're based in China, but maybe you had your residence in the US before, the statutes would apply to you. So in situations where in situations where a statute would apply just because you're out of the country um, does not kind of insulate from the joint employer staff finding. Um, I think where that might come into play the most would be whether those individuals count in the threshold determination of whether a statute is applicable. So to explain that, Title VII, for example, requires that you have at least or employ at least 50 employees. Um, the National Labor Relations Act has a similar requirement. So if those workers count, um, and, typically, and they could, courts have gone either way on that, then you have the same obligations to employees who are outside the company, uh, sorry, outside the country, and that doesn't really factor in. So the, the question is whether or not Georgia is a state that has more rigorous accommodation requirements as it pertains to pregnancy. And the answer is, as with most other things in Georgia, um, we follow the federal rules. Um, there isn't a more rigorous uh, law in Georgia.